She works now at Milton Biotech as a research uh, team coordinator and her research focuses on CAR T cell therapies in solid tumors. So Rita will tell us today you know, a story about multimodal and multi-scale imaging of CAR T cells in pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So the stage is yours, Rita. Looking forward to your talk. Yeah, thank you, Niza. And also thank you, Abhishek, for this great presentation, also the great insights. Um, yeah, those of you who are closely interacting with the Milton Biotech's uh, marketing department have already probably heard that um, Milton is one of its biggest clients itself. And I'm actually from the R&D department, and I would like to, yeah, as introduced by Nizad, introduce you to some of the work we have been doing in investigating CAR T-cell interactions with um, solid tumors using various imaging approaches. Now... As you already know, in hematological malignancies, CAR T cell therapy has been a real success story, and within the last four and a half years, six CAR based therapies have been approved for the treatment of different types of um, blood cancers. However, in the solid tumor setting, the picture is somewhat different. Here, the clinical experience has been pretty disappointing. And despite of 30 years of research, there is not one approved therapy. Um, the underlying biological mechanisms or obstacles are well known, and that yet they could not have come, they could not have been overcome yet. And one reason is a lack of um, yeah, precise interaction and insufficient understanding of the dynamic nature of CAR T-cell therapies at different time points. So at the moment, imaging-based approaches are getting more and more into focus to um, better understand these differences as the CAR T-cells interact in vivo. In the context of our in vivo studies, we introduced a multimodal and multiscale imaging workflow to monitor the CAR T cells um, during their action against solid tumors from whole body to um, single cell level. First, we started with 2D bioluminescent imaging. And um, one drawback of this approach, is, as you can already see here, is that 2D BLI can provide or gives you an idea of where the signal comes from, but it doesn't really uh, provide information as to from which organ it comes from. And to overcome this, we introduced 3D bioluminescent tomography to um, also segment the signals based on um, the organs and also quantitate the signals um, within the individual organs. However, one drawback here is that you don't have an understanding of how the cells interact. You don't have single cell resolution. And that's why we introduced light sheet fluorescence microscopy to better study the T cell interaction with the tumors on a single cell level. And last but not least, we uh, um, applied cyclic immunofluorescence staining to deep phenotype the tumor infiltrating T cells. So basically for the in vivo tracking using bioluminescent tomography, we used an optical imaging system that was combined with computer tomography to give the organ resolution and um, allow us for the quantitation of the signals in different organs. The CAR transgenes were designed as follows. We used a standard second generation CAR design um, with a CD8 alpha hinge and 41BB CD3 Z signaling domains. And the therapeutic CARs contained an SCFV um, from the clinical antibody cetuximab, which targets EGFR. And the control CAR was derived from the antibody MB101 targeting BDCA2, which in our context was neither expressed by the tumor cells nor in the mouse tissue. Now, downstream of the CAR, a luciferase gene was engineered, separated by a P2A element to allow for the in vivo tracking. Since it can be a bit tricky to target, uh, to um, image T cells, because T cells do not produce that much protein as tumor cells, we uh, used the click beetle red luciferase, um, which was further mutated to um, be more stable and provide a stronger signal. 
The in vivo studies were designed as follows. First pancreatic tumors were injected um, using the pancreatic cancer cell line, um, ASPC1. Um, then 11 days later, the CAR T-cell therapy was initiated by an a systemic administration of the cells. Now, since pancreatic cancer is notoriously immunosuppressive, we subdivided each group and then also further tested whether the application of IL-2 can increase the anti-tumor efficacy of the T cells. So an overall of four doses of IL-2 was given um, at the tumor side to the T cells and the effects were further investigated using either bioluminescence um, imaging in 2D or 3D and on selected days tumors were removed and uh, analyzed via ultramicroscopy and um, maxima um, and cyclic immunofluorescence using the maxima imaging system. Here you see the data um, that was generated by BLI. So directly after injection, you see the CAR T cells staying in the lung, and one week later, you see the primary homing to um, the spleen, and from then on, the T cells start to disseminate, and it becomes really hard to delineate as to where the uh, strongest signal are coming from. Um, in the therapy group, you have first a similar uh, picture, you have the cells going into the lung. In the first week, they traveled to the tumor site first, and then um, starting the second week, uh, additional signals come up that are, but become stronger, uh, more difficult to delineate. So that's why we switched over to 3D imaging. And um, yeah, here again, we observed directly after the injection, a signal popping up in the lungs. Uh, for the control-treated tumors, you see the first signal coming up in the spleen, and from there they disseminate as a, as a slide. You have a passive accumulation at the, or at the tumor sites, and then also at later stage at the um, intestine, which is indicative for GVHD. As for the therapy control, we have the primary signals coming up at the site where the tumor was injected and the spleen accumulation is delayed by a week um, and the signals further persist. When we look at the tumor control, this is also in line with the differential um, pharmacokinetics. For the EGFR-treated cohorts, we see tumor control, and, and whereas for the control-treated tumors, the, the, the tumor keeps growing. Now, when we look specifically at the BLI signal within the tumor, we see that in the beginning, the T cells strongly start to proliferate. We have a boost there, but it plateaus at some point, and then um, the T cell signal decreases. Now, this can have two reasons. Either this is due to activation-induced cell death, um, or the tumor reaches a site where the retention of the T-cells is not maintained and they actually travel away from the tumor, which is supported, for instance, by this data here where we see a spleen signal coming up. To better understand how the T-cells interact with the tumor itself, we then conducted light sheet fluorescence microscopy. For this, we took the tumor-bearing mice, injected them with rhodamin-lectin, to later visualize the blood vessels, and five minutes later, the tumors were excised. Then they were permeabilized, stained for CD3 using um, 3DIF validated antibodies. Then the tumors were cleared to render them optically um, transparent for imaging, and then subjected uh, to ultramicroscopic analyses. Following the acquisition, um, the raw data was processed in various steps, and in the following movie, I would like to um, sum up and show you in a nutshell how um, the, process, um, yeah, the processing of um, the raw data was conducted. So basically, in green, you have the rhodamine lectin staining, whereas in blue is the CD3 staining. And first of all, what happens is that adjacent tissue is being removed so that only the tumor entity remains, and then the, the vasculature is uh, segmented and reconstructed. 
with regard to the CD3 staining, um, the CD3 T cells are counted based on dot detection and they can further also color code it based on their location in the tumor. In addition to that, you can also look at how much volume the T cells occupy within the tumor using the volume reconstruction as shown here and this also in a distance dependent manner. And we made the following observation in terms of T cell infiltration. So for the control treated tumors, we see a limited infiltration, which is more pronounced when IL-2 is supplied. However, what is noticeable is that the majority of the T cells is located at the outer part of um, the tumor. As for the um, EGFR cut treated tumors, we have a higher infiltration, but here again, a decent amount of T cells is located at the um, outer layers of the tumor and um, only very few manage to penetrate um, into the core. And what is also noticeable is that you have a cluster-like um, island formation of the T cells, meaning you don't have the T cells distributing evenly, but you have a, a side-targeted anti-tumor response. And a similar picture is also true for uh, week two, here represented by day 13. Overall, we have a higher T cell infiltration, but again, the majority of the T cells are located primarily at the outer layers of the tumor. When we now um, quantitate the T cells and look at their penetration depth, we can observe that in general the EGFR CAR T cells penetrate deeper into the tumor than the BDCA2 CAR T cells, which appear not to go deeper than the most outer 100 micrometer. But this penetration um, plateaus very quickly and the migratory capacity decreases the deeper we go into the tumor. When we compare it to the IL-2 treated counterparts, we see that while um, IL-2 seems to boost the proliferation of the T cells, it does not necessarily increase the penetration into the tumor. So within the first 100, uh, 300 micrometers, the, uh, we see higher frequency of T cells, but then this effect uh, reverses and um, the migratory capacity decreases drastically. And this is true both for the EGFR, but also for the BDCA2 treated tumors. Now, clustering of the T cells based on their density then further shows that um, those T cells that pro proliferate intensively are again located in the outer part of the tumor. And those who actually manage to go into the tumor have a compromised proliferative capacity. And this is true both for week one as well as week two. So the majority here you can see in red um, that those cells that undergo the most active proliferation are located at the outside. And this is significant in that way that those T cells that um, manage to eventually migrate into the tumor have also a most restricted um, migratory capacity which compromises the anti-tumor response from within the tumor. So in the next step, we wanted to phenotype the tumor infiltrating T cells, and for this we used the Maxima imaging system, which works by iterative uh, stainings for the respective antigen. So basically the way it works, you stain your sample with one antigen, then you take the image, you erase the antigen, and then you continue with an antibody directed for another specificity. And it goes like this on and on, and. Um, um, with this, you can image up to 200 antibodies. So using uh, this approach, we actually uh, made the following observation. On the right side, you see the control-treated tumors where we have very limited T cell infiltration. But when you look at the therapy-treated tumors, you can notice two things. One is that um, consistent with the UM data, we see that the T cell clusters, as indicated, for instance, here, here, but also here, they're located more at the outside of the tumor. Um, and um, 
the other thing is those that manage to migrate deeper into the tumor do not have such an extended uh, capacity. But they're still active, as you can uh, look at the EGFR staining. Those where you, uh, the, where you have a staining for CD3, you don't have a correlation with the EGFR staining, meaning they're actually um, fighting against the tumor. When we later looked at the humor based analysis, we saw that um, in all cohorts, both the tumor cells and the T cells cluster differently, so we wanted to see what defines their phenotype. First, when we looked at the CD3 negative compartment, we saw no differences in the vasculature, as indicated here by the mouse CD31 staining. We saw differences in the EGFR, specifically for the IL-2-treated uh, counterpart. We saw a, uh, a um, yeah, reduced levels of EGFR1 population and one that is coming up indicating that you have anti-EGFR activity but then also the tumors actively fight and um, grow. And in addition to that, also we observe significant changes in CD54 expression. CD54 is an adhesion molecule. Um, and was reported um, to be upregulated upon cytokine stimulation. So we observe here a slight shift upon IL-2 administration, but more specifically when we look at the therapy-treated cohorts, you have a dramatic upregulation in both cohorts, um, the um, EGFR as well as the EGFR plus IL-2 groups. And last but not least, also the tumors seem to fight the CAR T cell response by upregulating the tumor growth promoting um, antigen CD39, as indicative here. So coming back to this CD54 staining, we actually wanted to have a closer look at this to why this is being upregulated. And as you can observe here, we found that um, the majority of this um, adhesion molecule seems to be upregulated at the outer parts of the tumor. The corresponding um, ligand LFA1 is expressed by the T cells. And um, in fact, we also observed that the T cells seem to be trapped in the outer layers of the tumor by the ACOM1 expression as here and here. So that means that in addition to, to the dysmoplasia that is characteristic for the tumors, we have also additional mechanisms kicking in that support, um, yeah, that inhibit the T cells from efficiently penetrating the solid tumor and have an active response. Because outside you have the adhesion molecule expression that seem to trap the T cells and with additional um, mechanisms, they're building silence, such as CD39 expression, but the areas where cancer stem cells are reported to be expressed, that is more in the necrotic areas and where hypoxia is um, occurring, you actually have uh, almost no T cell infiltration. Last but not least, when we looked at uh, this um, CD3 positive population, we observed a drastic yeah, we observe an upregulation of CD38, which is reported to be upregulated upon cytokine administration, but we saw also a drastic upregulation of PD1 once IL-2 was administered to, G to the EGFR-treated cohorts. Uh, moreover, the T cells also expressed CD39, which is a um, molecule for um, T cell exhaustion, and CD169, which was reported which has different um, functionalities, but was, among others, also reported to act as a checkpoint inhibitor, meaning that um, the IL-2 supply actually further boosts the differenti differentiation of the T cells towards a exhaustive phenotype. And with this, I would like to sum up. So um, in a nutshell, we showed a non-invasive and longitudinal tracking approach of luciferase car positive T cells. And um, do in doing so, we observed that the T cell homing to the tumor site is, um, is there, but it and depends uh, and acts in an antigen uh, recognition dependent manner. 
um, using high resolution profiling with light sheet fluorescence microscopy, we identified that the CAR T cells primarily localized to the tumor margin and observe poor infiltration into the tumors. Um, the correlation of, we, moreover, we increase a correlation, uh, we observe a correlation of increased transgenic cells with therapeutic efficacy of EGFR CAR T cells. And um, the administered IL-2 showed increases in T cell proliferation, but not necessarily a boost in the CAR T cell performance. And last but not least, local IL-2 seemed to accelerate the exhaustion phenotype of the CAR T cells. Um, I say seem here because we still need to uh, verify it via NGS. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, also my colleagues at Miltony. In particular, I would like um, to, to highlight the contribution of Wael Arravashte, who set the stage for the project, and Katarina Wittig, who um, conducted um, a lot of experiments in um, this project.